Well, good morning and welcome, everybody. Uh, make sure your microphone is off. I can hear somebody breathing heavily because their microphone is still on. I won't start until the breathing heavily stops. So please switch off both your video and the audio, the microphone, which are bottom left on your screen. Have you done that? I hope so. Okay. So welcome to this webinar. I'm very glad you could make it. Um, it's going to be interactive. So I'll be giving you many opportunities to comment and join in, whether you're English teachers or not, it doesn't matter. Um, our subject is the coming together of these two huge strands of the English Romantic poets and the Greek Revolution for Independence. And then I can hear microphones again. When you see this uh, red question mark or any question mark, it means I want you to think or I want you to participate either mentally or by writing in the chat box, by responding to my questions, if you can, if you would like to, or just thinking about them. So to give you an example, to begin, I'll show you a picture. Here is a painting. What words come to mind? What associations does this painting, any you like, any words or phrases that spring to mind, any associations, write them down in the chat box so we can test that you can hear me and that you know how to use your chat box. I'm looking at your comments. I can't see any comments yet. We're looking at this wonderful painting. I won't say anything. Somebody thank you says it represents helplessness. Any other comments? Devastation, despair, suffering. Lovely, another despair. Now you're all very desperate, I see. Perhaps it's the times we're living through. Of course, it is a tragic painting in many ways, but there's a positive way of looking at it as well. I see any more comments, please. Don't be shy. I would like you all to have a go. You can be thinking or writing. Okay, revolt, says Vicky. Thank you, Vicky. Revolt. Well, hope, says Eleanor. Indeed, victory. Well, I've chosen this picture, Felicity, Felicita Rosalia. Nice to see your face. Can you please uh, disappear now? Thank you. Right. So let me tell you a story then. Uh, resurrection, freedom, and so on. Well, you know, the first time I ever encountered the Greek revolution when I, it was when I was... Um, a child, I was, I don't know, I must have been eight or nine years old. And we used to, I was in the UK at the time. I was um, an immigrant in the UK. And because of our Greek background, we would go to the so-called Saturday school uh, to learn basic things about the Greek language and, and about Greek history. Anyway, on the wall of this place we used to go to for the school, it was a church actually, in one of the rooms in the church, there was this painting. I didn't know anything about Greece. I was young when we left uh, Cyprus. Uh, I was, uh, so I was eight years old and I see this painting. And for me, it, it was my first encounter with the Greek revolution, uh, the war of independence in, in 1821. And it struck me that Greece must be a very beautiful place. I mean, obviously there is suffering there, but I think I was struck by the beauty of this vision of Greece. And amidst the tragedy, she seemed to me a very beautiful woman, this Greece. And I was determined to one day, I suppose, see the, the reality behind the image. So this, of course, is a famous painting, which we'll be coming back to by Delacroix. Uh, and it's uh, Greece uh, on the ruins of Messalonghi during the War of Independence. I didn't know that at the time. But we'll come back to it. So that's my first encounter, not through the poets, not through Wordsworth and Keats, but through this painting of a beautiful woman. So Greece and freedom is a beautiful woman for me. And um, I think I came to Greece looking for somebody who looked like this. Uh, good morning, Antoinette. Can you please switch your video off? There's a good lady. Thank you, Antoinette. So the Greek Revolution of 1821 is our subject. That's how some of you see this painting 
and whether it's strength or beauty or tragedy or despair, we're going to look at this movement and how it connects with another movement of romanticism. Look at this painting. What feelings does it arouse? What words come to mind as you see this painting? And I'll tell you then why I chose it. Calm. Where is it set? Where are we? Escape. How many people are there? What are they doing? Tranquility. Nostalgia. The countryside. This is another painting that goes back to my childhood. Before I knew anything about romanticism, before I knew anything about the Greek Revolution, Byron and so on, and William Wordsworth, I knew nothing. But I saw this painting in our house, in the fish and chip shop that we used to run uh, in, in Birmingham. And there was this lovely painting. I realized I can listen to my phone. Please switch off your microphone. Um, this painting, my mother must have picked up from somewhere, the supermarket or wherever. It was a very popular painting. And of course, it captures, I discovered later, some very typical characteristics of romanticism. It's The Haywain by John Constable, a romantic painter. So this was my introduction to romanticism. So we know now how I met the Greek Revolution as a child, a beautiful woman, and romanticism is a very beautiful scene of calm, tranquility, and isolation in the countryside, nature in a word. So this is the plan for today. Thank you very much for your contributions. Keep contributing. Don't leave me on my own here. So I'm going to ask some questions as we go along so you can join me in answering them. So how did the romantics see this country, this Greece? We'll go to, first of all, our first stop is with uh, the, the poet John Keats, who also, by the way, celebrates, celebrates is not the word, we mark 200 years since the Greek Revolution, and also since the death of the great John Keats, the young John Keats who died at the age of 23, 24, in Rome, as many of you will know. And we will ask, about his realms of gold, his world of poetry, and why he loved the Greeks in particular, and how we can see this in his poetry. We'll ask who were these romantic poets? What's Luke talking about? Who are the romantic poets? Exactly. What are the roots of romanticism? Where does it all come from? What is it? Moore has a broken leg and he's in a wheelchair, and um, he's like early to mid thirties, very attractive. I think I know who you're talking about. Oh, yay! Great! Okay, what room number is he in? I'm sorry. That information is restricted to hospital staff. Uh, she's sorry. with me, Dr. Drake Ramore. <laughs> Let me just see if I can, um, Dr. Drake if I can mute. Ramore. Excuse me, I have to mute. We need that information. I'm a doctor. How can I mute Dr. everybody? Damn it, woman, we're losing precious time. Do um, you want this man's blood on your head? I need to mute everybody. How can I mute them? You tell me what room the man my assistant described is staying in. He's a patient of mine. I've been treating him for years. He's a patient. Just, wait a minute. Thank you. And what is his name? No. I can't decide whether it would go better next to the... Mute all. Okay. Uh, I do apologize. You see what I mean? <laughs> I've muted all the participants there. Can you still hear me? Please write in the in the chat box whether you can still hear me yes yes you can hear and you can see me and everything so i should have done this at the beginning as my sister advised me to mute everybody till the end so i was saying before i was rudely interrupted um we'll look at what is romanticism and why the greek revolution of 1821 why they why were they so interested and passionate about the Greek Revolution. And we'll focus, of course, on Byron and Shelley and their contribution in an active way to the struggle of the Greeks. And how did art, we'll go beyond the poets and look at the painters too, and how art supported the Greek Revolution. I will end, of course, by paying tribute to the greatest philoline um, in our collection today, Lord Byron, one of the greatest philolines. And, Lovers of freedom of all time. 
So that's the plan for today. And as it's an interactive web webinar, let's get interacting. Are you ready to go? Here's your first question, your starter for 10. Here are some vocabulary words for those of you who are teachers of English, and they fall into two groups, adjectives and nouns. I've selected them all from the poets that we are talking about today. What do they talk about? What is the topic you think which brings together all of these words? Is it poetry? Do these adjectives describe poetry from a romantic perspective? Is it romanticism itself? Or do they all describe ancient Greece? They're all words used by our poets. Ancient Greece, possibly, Vicky says. Ancient Greece, Maria Luisa. Ancient Greece. So if, ancient, if this is ancient Greece, this is vocabulary, lexical sets, as we call them, which tell us how the romantics saw ancient Greece. Because they're all words, as I said, taken from poems by our poets. And the answer, of course, is ancient Greece. And the poets use words like golden, eternal, immortal, free, heroic, and the line, and splendor, I think, should be in the next column, <laughs> the next sex section. Did you spot that deliberate mistake? Word splendor is a noun. So that should go in the next group. And the words, of course, the nouns are God's glory, beauty. If I were teaching students, I could ask them, like I'm going to ask you, to make a combination of adjective and noun, which you think could describe ancient Greece and why the Romantics admired it so much. So this is collocation. We take an adjective, we match it with um, a noun. Anybody like to have a go? Any acceptable collocation of adjective and noun? I hope you're still there, because I don't see any responses yet. Good old Yannis Haliotis. Thank you very much, Yanni. Immortal beauty, eternal beauty. Nice. You can play this game with students almost, developing their sense of lexical combinations. Um, for example, I would say eternal beauty, like you, we agree. Immortal truth, it's exactly the kinds of things that we find the poets talk about in connection with Greece, and particularly one of the poets, which we're going to come to in just one moment. Before we do that, let's turn to the third strand. We've got the Greek Revolution. Thank you, immortal truth, says Anna. We've got the Greek Revolution. We've got romanticism, and we've got poetry. Now, let's go back to the Greek gods. Here's a simple question for you. Which Greek god do you associate with poetry? Who is the god of poetry? Any guesses before I give you a clue? Use your chat box if you're still there. Apollo, Apollo, I have some guesses, or people may well know it's not a difficult question. The Greek god, well, the clue I could give you is this handsome sculpture here of the god Phoebus, Apollo. Let me remind you, this is not a test. It's a game of you joining in. I'm not going to mark you down. Okay. Apollo is indeed the god of poetry. I mentioned this, Aphrodite, the god of love, she comes into it because love, passion, is very much a part of this story of ours today. And there you are, you see, Apollo is the god of poetry. He's also the god of music, beauty, truth, and the sun. And these words, which represent uh, Apollo, almost capture the spirit of a particular poet that we're going to begin with. And that poet, of course, is John Keats. These are all words, I think, that we will find in his poetry, in his realms of gold, as he calls them. And we're going to ask, as we listen to a couple of his poems, why he loved Greece so much and how this shapes his poetry. Here's a little task for you. Here's a beautiful poem about how Keats first discovered Greek poetry in translation in English. There is a word missing in this little text. I've given you the word Apollo. 
there is a word missing and there's a picture there to help you guess which word it is. So Keats tells us, much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many Western islands have I been, which bars in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep browed, and there is the name of a poet, ruled as his demean. So he's saying he's seen many kinds of poetry. He traveled to Scotland in real life. He traveled to different parts of the country, but he didn't he got to Italy, of course. In Italy, we have Dante. We have great poets there too. But the one that shaped him more than any other, of course, is in the picture there, and it is Homer. So it all begins with Apollo, Greek myths, in other words, and the great poet, one of the greatest, along with Dante and, and Goethe in world literature. So as we listen to this poem, this short sonnet, which is um, it's about how Keats first read the translation by George Chapman of the Iliad in English for the first time. The, the translation was at the time of Shakespeare. Chapman was a contemporary of Shakespeare. And this was a revelation, this translation to John Keats. And I ask you, as you listen, it's a very short poem, so be patient. Two things that Keats compares Homer to. Are you ready to listen out for the two things? Here is John Keats. Here is his poem. Listen for the two things to which he compares Homer. On first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. So there's the beautiful poem on first looking into Chapman's Homer and why he admired Homer so much. What was it like to discover Homer for the first time? Well, first thing he compares Homer to is a planet, a new planet. Can you guess which planet this is? That was discovered in the time of Keats and was much discussed. So he had it very much in mind. Saturn, says Anna Saba, but it looks like Saturn. And I thought the picture must be the wrong one because I always thought Saturn looked like this. But apparently at the time, anybody else, any, which planet was discovered? I think it was 1791, 17. For the first time, Herschel, the guy called William Herschel, he, um, Eleanor says Jupiter. Um, now I get the Latin and the Greek names mixed up, so you'll forgive me. But um, the planet which was discovered at the time of Keats, and everybody was talking about this, this German guy, Herschel, he was in England, and he had this passion for astronomy. It was um, Uranus, in fact, and uh, that's eventually what they called it. It wasn't called Uranus to begin with, but that's the one that Keats is referring to. And of course, who is this? Did you hear Keats telling us? Stout Cortez, indeed. He does look stout with all that armor on. Uh, he's the costume there. And of course, the reason he mentions Cortez is that Homer is like a discovery of a new world, just like it was the discovery of a new planet. Uranus is also the discovery of a whole continent. That's how Homer seemed to Keats. So my friends, it all begins with Homer 
and Greek mythology, the story of ours, of the Romantics and the Greek Revolution, why they came together. I suppose in a sense, we owe it to Homer. Without Homer and Apollo, perhaps the Greek Revolution might never have succeeded. You'll see what I mean as we go along. And of course, something we've mentioned in looking at the painting by Delacroix, the love of freedom, liberty. Um, and of course, another great influence was a French philosopher, great influence on political and social movements at the time was a French philosopher, or was he Swiss? He may have been Swiss, Swiss French. And he said these words, man is born free. We would say, and women today, mankind. Men and women are born free, and everywhere they are in chains. Who said it? Well, some people are guessing wildly that it may be Rousseau. Let me give you a clue. Who is this? Is this Rousseau, or is it somebody else? Is it Voltaire? Yes, says Penelope, this is Rousseau. It is indeed Rousseau. I was just bluffing. And he said this, not only did he say that, his famous quotation, but of course he wrote a lot of stuff about um, society, about politics, as a nature which influenced the romantics um, and the French Revolution and all of that stuff. And education, we as teachers still have a lot to learn from his work on education. So there you are, these are the strands, the revolution, mythology, poetry, and the concept of freedom, which all the romantics have in common. All of them, I say, we'll come back to the other romantics and how freedom is a common theme. But let's stay with our poet and this poem and ask you, from the picture, can you guess which poem I'm going to talk about? Which poet it is? Elizabeth Evans, I see you there with your dear husband, a nice picture. Um, Keats says Anna Maria. Maria Luisa, a Grecian urn. Indeed, the poem and the poet, Ode on a Grecian urn. So let's get a little bit closer to the language of these poets and the concepts. Here's a little reading task for you. Scanning, let's call it. Scan this short text and find words that refer to Greece. I've given you an example, deities. Ignore any difficulties. If you were my students, I would say, just focus on the task. Which other words apart from deity refers to, to ancient Greece? Any offers? Type, please, in the chat box. RKD, says Maria Luisa. Thank you, Maria Luisa. You're helping me a lot here. Anna Sava, RKD, of course. And as we go down, temple. So these are simple things that students can do. Tempi, RKD, men, God, gods, I mean, you see. So these are the themes, these are the places, these are the mythological figures that Keats has in mind. As he looks at the representations on this urn, what could they represent? Why is this urn such a wonderful embodiment of his beliefs? His most profound convictions about poetry and life itself. What a beautiful poem it is. But there's more words. Let's just have a look at a few more. A couple more words here with it, which we would associate with ancient Greece. Uh, anybody? Anybody? Don't leave me on my own. Chat in the chat box. I can see three words at least, which I would say connect to ancient Greece. Marble, thank you. Eleanor, beautiful. Marble, Penelope. Of course, the word right at the beginning in the first line, the shape he calls it is an attic shape to do with Athens, the Athens area, or the culture of Athens, and all the rest of it. Well, you see, the key word for me here, apart from marble, which is material, is the concept of eternity. And this eternity, we saw immortal earlier on, comes back again and again that what the Greeks gave us, um, in the West at least, 
is uh, our values, which are eternal. A bit like Shakespeare, not for one age, but for all time. And this is true of the great literature of Europe and the world, which we so admire. And the phrases now, let's go to phrases, from words to phrases. For example, Keats says, when old age shall this generation waste? And he's talking literally, you see, he didn't get to old age, but his health, as you know, was wasted by disease and he died young. But these values shall remain in midst of other woe than ours. It was a troubled time after the French Revolution, the early 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. Hygiene was worse than it is today, even without pandemic. Although that pandemic, we're breaking all records. And here the phrase I would like you to find is the one which captures the philosophy of ancient Greece for Keats and what is represented in this urn. And Maria Luisa and Amanda, thank you very much. You've, um, you've, you agree that this really is both about Greece, beauty is truth, truth is beauty. And we see it in the Parthenon and the Parthenon sculptures and everything there in all of their art and in all great art. This is what great art is all about in the final analysis. Um, and the humanism, the anthropocentric philosophy of the Greeks, although they believed in their Olympic gods, even their Olympic gods were anthropomorphic, weren't they? They were like people. So it's the beginning of a kind of humanism. Let's look at man and woman less unfortunate, um, which is what the philosophers did and the poets and playwrights. And they were looking at humanity in the broad sense and the beauty of their language, the beauty of their sculptures, the beauty of their architecture and this vase. So who are the poets? Here we are. Write any names that you can identify. Who are we talking about? I've mentioned some already. Use your chat box, play the game. It's not a test. You will not be excluded from the rest of the webinar if you get any wrong. Wordsworth is definitely there. Coleridge is there. Byron is there. My God, you're a well-read lot. There's nothing for me to do. You're doing it all for me. You've got them all, I think. I think you've got them all. There they are. Number one. I am waiting. I can wait as long as you can. Amanda says Blake, and she's right, of course. Number two, number two, number two. Check your spelling. Byron says Penelope, well spotted. And what about this one, number three? Shelley says Demetrius, Sophia, well done. Number four, number four. Yes, you've got it, you've got it. And the next one, the least well-known perhaps, is Coleridge. And finally, the wonderful, youthful, tragic. Some say he would have been another Shakespeare had he lived. And when you read his odes, you can see what they meant, what magic with language. So there they are. These are the six poets. We'll be focusing on three of them in particular, four, let's say with Wordsworth. And I've divided them into two groups, as you can see, because they do belong to two generations. In the first row, we have the first generation of romantic poets, the main ones, let's say there were others, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Blake. Those first two go together, of course, the Lake poets. Blake was a very idiosyncratic case. As we shall see, he differed and was wonderful. Some would say he was the greatest of all, but who could be spoiled for choice? The younger generation in the second row are Keats, Byron, and Shelley. And there are some interesting differences between them. One of them, the differences is captured in these figures. Can you guess what these numbers refer to? They refer to the two groups, something which distinguished the two groups, the two generations. Amanda says the age at which they died, their age indeed, exactly. And it is odd that the first generation Wordsworth, Coleridge and Blake, they lived much longer. It was it an accident that the second group, 
Byron, Shelley and Keats all died young. The youngest of all, of course, was Keats. And you know who died at the age of 36? And he wrote a poem just before he died. Can anybody guess the last one? Who was 36 when he died? Byron indeed was 36 and he wrote a poem on his 36th birthday, which was January the 22nd. It's a very moving poem, I will come back to it. Brilliant, wonderful poem. His last words and he knew he was dying. We'll come back to that. So, how can we explain these age differences? Was it anything to do with um, their mortality, I mean, with uh, what was going on in society at the time? What was going on? What were the great movements? Let's say we choose three or four great social, political or philosophical movements. Which would you say, what was going on in the late 18th century, early 19th? Any, any idea what are the, and we, I call these the roots of romanticism. Revolution is one thing. The enlightenment is another revolution. The French revolution was going on and its repercussions are still with us today. In May 68 in France, the echoes are still with us. So you've got two of the ones I have in mind. The industrial Re revolution, of course. Amanda is on the ball today. She's on a roll. Thank you, Amanda. The Industrial Revolution also shaped the, our poets in a profound way and may even have affected their health, like it affects our health. The revolution in our sense is the technological one. Um, the revolution in Italy, Elena says. And of course, Byron got involved in that as well, apart from picking up his great love. The great love of his life was this Italian aristocratic lady, what's her name? He also was in favor of, you know, the reunification or the unification of, of Italy. I and mean, he did his bit there in Italy before moving on to Greece and did his last bit there, unfortunately. So well done, well done. You got them all right, I think. I've added the social circumstances of the time, social inequality, uh, the main classes then, to some extent, they still are the aristocracy or the elite the landed aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the rising middle class, the commercial mercantilist um, you know, influence, and the working class, everybody else, the agrarian workers and the industrial workers, which was the new working class. So let's see how these movements, in a very simple way, shape the way romantics developed and were formed. A quick quiz for you. I'm going to show you a picture and perhaps a little poem as well. And together they represent one of these four socio political aesthetic movements. Let's see if you can guess which one. Here is a painting. What's the event? The event in this painting, which we've mentioned, is the French Revolution. And the poet, our poet William. Wordsworth was involved directly in the French Revolution as a young man. He became an arch conservative when he was older, but this happens to us as we grow old. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heavenly. He's talking about the French Revolution and being part of this momentous social, political, aesthetic change in the world. It was one of the great revolutions. So there you are, the French Revolution, shaping the Romantics. And the big daddy of them all was William Wordsworth, although Byron had a great fun satirizing Wordsworth and the late poets. And this one, was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? What is the poet referring to here? Amanda says the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the Mills does refer to the Industrial Revolution. William Blake, his ideal was Jerusalem in a metaphorical sense, he's not talking literally, was Jerusalem, was this ideal world he imagines of equality and justice and spiritual freedom. Was it built here in the Industrial Revolution? 
and all the suffering that it brought, the opportunities too, but problems of homelessness, health, poverty. William Blake, the Industrial Revolution, Jerusalem. Now, interesting, this one, a painting which captures another one of these four movements in a satirical way, in a way it's critical. Uh, this is Newton or somebody like Newton, it could well be a figure like Newton or God even. It is Blake, of course. And what is he talking about when he says, mock on, mock on, Amanda, you're on a roll. It is Urizen. Urizen is a pun on reason. Mock on, mock on, Voltaire Rousseau. Mock on, mock on. It is all in vain. You throw the sand against the wind and the wind blows it back again. So here he's disagreeing with this massive movement, which is captured in the word reason, and it's captured in the word enlightenment. And this is God, if you like, or the God of reason, or it's Newton, it's the scientists, it's the scientific frame of mind, measuring the world and, and calculating. And this is what Blake as a poet was out of tune with. He criticized Voltaire, Rousseau, and their rationalism, their empiricism, because he was a man of the spirit, very socially rooted, of course, and angry about the suffering of children being sent up chimneys and the Industrial Revolution and how it victimized working people. But he wasn't happy with the Enlightenment for many reasons, which is not true of all the poets. They, they don't all believe the same things. Coleridge, for example, is very interested in science and reason. He was a philosopher himself. But this is Blake. And I'll give you the last one, the social movements, uh, aristocracy, the bourgeoisie equality. It's captured in Shelley's poem. Uh, I think this is the mask of anarchy. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Castlereagh was one of the most influential British politicians of the time. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. What he's talking about is the crushing of the Peterloo demonstration. I think it was in 1819, somewhere around there, where people were demonstrating and demanding their right to be represented. It was near Manchester, indeed. Uh, Peter Lerner film was made recently by Mike Lee on Peter Lou. So it's a massive symbolic event where working people demanding simple representation in parliament, parliamentary democracy, which we today take for granted. And it is under threat, as we know, in various countries, for whatever reason or another, political, economic, religious, parliamentary democracy, though, the struggle began in this era of the Romantics and the Peterloo massacre is a notorious attempt by the government to crush the workers and they did by killing dozens of these innocent unarmed demonstrators. And Shelley, of course, we'll see was very much on the side of the people as they all were, except when a couple of them grew older. So let's be more specific about Romanticism. Any words that you would say Capture romanticism. You haven't written to me for a long time. So why don't you write some words which capture what you think romanticism means? Vicky says nature. Clearly, we mentioned it. It's very important. It's a fundamental concept. Imagination, says Amanda. You see, where the previous generation of poets was more rational, the classical poets, Pope, Dryden, and so on in England at least, were... Um, more about society, weren't they? They wrote about society, they were more rational, more logical. Whereas our poets focus on idealism, as you say, Athanasia, um, um, a reaction against rationalism, indeed, a love. So there's emotion for you, idealism, revolt, revolution. Exactly. I'll show you some paintings which capture some of these concepts you've given me. Nature, I give it you back, and you've given me some more. So my turn to give you a few words. And with these words, these concepts, we'll talk about the paintings and the poets. Um, 
Solitude is a, is a theme, you see, that comes up again and again. It's a kind of idealism that you can be in a world, Anna, of your own, far from the madding crowd, as Hardy says, he's a late romantic, you see. The love of nature and an isolation in nature as a good thing. Solitude is a good thing. It's a positive, a virtue, whether you're alone or with your loved one, as in this painting here. So here you see are some key words, and you mentioned most of them, which is fantastic. Um, I would say this particular painting by Friedrich, Caspar uh, Friedrich, um, man and woman contemplating the moon. We can see nature. There must be some emotion there. She's touching his shoulder. Who knows what's going to happen next? But we'd better turn her aside and let them get on with it. Solitude. You may say, oh, there's a sense of freedom. Love is there, which you mentioned. So there you are. So these paintings are typical romantic paintings. And these are the words I want you to use as I show you some paintings. You say, well, for me, you can add other words, of course. Uh, this painting captures the following concept. So here's the painting we began with, which I saw as an eight-year-old or a young lad in Birmingham on the wall of our house. And it was my first encounter with, with uh, romanticism. Now, which words did you say? You, can you give me them again, a couple of words from the list I've given you? Remember the list? There you are. So to remind you. This painting, can you see it? Anybody? I won't move on till I see a word in the, in the chat box. I'm waiting. I can see nature. I can see the love of freedom. I can see solitude. Indeed, indeed, it's all there, you see. It's all there. Well, it makes it easy if I give you the words. It's a kind of a multiple choice. You're free to add your own words, of course. But it's wonderful how Constable's painting captures so much of what we find in Wordsworth as well, you see. The Hay Wayne by Constable. Yes, Mary, imagination is there as well. I haven't underlined it, but you could nearly say all of these words one way or the other, all of these concepts. And nature, of course, is a fundamental concept, as you've said, beginning with Rousseau. Wordsworth picks up the idea of nature and nature becomes the great teacher for them. Perhaps it should become the great teacher for us now because we are in dire need of nature. Well, let's get back to our students. And we're teaching them words about nature. Okay, useful vocabulary to come down to earth. Some of these words in the list, they're all taken from a poem we're gonna look at, are not about nature. Which ones don't belong? Which are the odd words out? Write any one in the chat box, please. City, factory, Maria Luisa. Couch, of course, not difficult for you, but perhaps a nice way for students to get into a, a poem which may otherwise be quite difficult for them. So we're making it more accessible. So these are the words which I think don't fit the theme of nature, but they are important in what the poet wants to say. In this poem, which you can guess, it's a very famous, it's probably the, the kind of iconic romantic poem not the best one of all time. Which poem are we going to listen to? Which poem are we going to have a quick look at, Anna Maria? Daffodils, and Mara, Maria Luisa seems to know it by heart. I was wandering lonely, <laughs> like a cloud. Fantastic. Yes, indeed. And here now we can ask the students to look at the beginning of this beautiful poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud and say which words refer to nature. You see, thank you, Odysseus. And you can look at these words again, find anyone, it's full of words. It's absolutely chock-a-block. It's a great way to learn words to do with nature, apart from being a very memorable context for learning, poetry, literature, creative work is a great mnemonic, isn't it? And iPad, I don't see the word iPad. Okay, Bales, Maria Luisa, Hills, Lake, thank you. Once I get a contribution, I can move on. I'm a robot who doesn't work if you don't press the right button. The right button is the chat box button. So there you go. I can give you these now, thanks to Maria Luisa. 
Thank you, Maria Luisa. So the students have found these key words. And here's the poet wandering lonely as a cloud over vales and hills, and he sees his daffodils, the lake, the trees. And of course, he's a poet of the lakes, the Lake District, beautiful part of the country, wonderful part. And why is all this important to him? Why does it make him happy? When is he most happy? Because nature gives him the chance to be what? When is he most happy? When he is with his friends, having coffee in the city, when he's on his own, when he's at home, Maria Luisa, or when he's at home, this is very important. You see, he loves being alone, the bliss, the happiness, Amanda, yes, of solitude. He's alone in nature. Nature is the great teacher. He takes the lessons of the great teacher, nature, when he goes back home and when he lies on his couch in vacant or in pensive mood, he thinks about the lessons, the beauty that nature has given him. Let's hear him. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. There you are, all alone in nature. This is probably one of the most iconic, as they say paintings of romanticism and a lot of the ideas we've mentioned are there any ones we would choose just one here or any one of your own what feelings it brings what concepts you associate with this painting this very famous painting i think by the same chap casper friedrich freedom the sense of freedom being away in nature rodrigo peacefulness solitude the infinite, wonderful, we haven't got that. And of course, they do talk about the infinite, immortality. Wordsworth wrote the ode on immortality. And we saw Keats talking about eternity, the infinite, the panacea. Papa Dimitrio, my old student, my young student, not so young anymore. Freedom, of course. Thank you, and many, many others. So I'm just giving some examples. And this one, you see again and again, this reminds me of Wuthering Heights for some reason. So I find this a very um, forever young. And poetry, of course, keeps us forever young. Um, we can see nature here, obviously. Look at the painting, what other feelings. If this were Wuthering Heights, which word would come to mind? Kathy and Heathcliff. Look at those waters. Look at the water. Look at the rocks. Look at the sky. No, no offers. You're looking at this painting in a gallery and Dominiki, Dominiki Rugneri finds inspiration, emotion, indeed. Thank you, imaginary, a castle. 
It is the Gothic as well, isn't it? There's the castle. We haven't mentioned the Gothic. But it's the strange world of the Romantics, far from the city in many ways, except for Byron, who was more a poet of the city in some ways, as we shall see, but there you go. They're not all the same. Thank you very much, Mystery Rodrigo. Lots of other concepts here. I think this is one, nearly one of our last ones, not a difficult one. These creatures had a very special place in the heart of the Romantics, didn't they? Um, this concept of childhood. And why was childhood such a big deal? Why childhood? Why children, Amanda? What do the children represent? Then and now, purity, says Sophia, the child's mind, of course, the freedom, the innocence of its mind. And we pollute it. This is what Wordsworth tells us. And Blake, of course, wonderful Blake and Wordsworth, they all talk about children. Coleridge does about his son. Beautiful poem. What you call it? The Frost at Midnight. It was a hard issue to be a child. It was certainly difficult. They did exploit them and not much has changed. Was, sadly, we're going back in some cases. The chimney sweep, Amanda, very good. Okay, so much we could say about childhood. And to finish, of course, we have another painting by the great French painter. And what is this about? What words does this bring to mind? The obvious words, I suppose, which we began with, anyways. Any offers, revolution of Dominique, freedom. This is again painting by Delacroix. It's not the French Revolution, but it's closely associated with the French Revolution. Independence of thought, Rodrigo, thank you very much. Revival. It's interesting, he's got this beautiful woman there, again, like the one that brought me to Greece in the first place, looking for this woman. Um, liberty, who is liberty, who is freedom. And I perhaps found her when I came and found Maria Faranduri when she was young, this singer of Mikis Dothrakis. When I came, first came to Greece and I saw Maria, she was very beautiful. She's still beautiful, much larger than she was then. She was young and beautiful then and seemed to embody for me that painting by Delacroix uh, of freedom, Greece rising from the ruins of Mesolonghi. Um, and Greece rising from the ruins of the Junta in 1974. And Maria Faranduri, this wonderful singer, uh, stood for liberty, Penelope, shaking the chains of tyranny off. Wonderful painting by Delacroix. So let's go from ancient Greece to the Greek Revolution. Time flies. Who wrote this? Not difficult. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, very quickly, and I'll move on. Write the name of the poet the, where burning Sappho loved. Thank you, Amanda. It's Byron. He wrote this. And as we listen to the poem, I want you to tell me which passionate Greek poet does Byron mention? Which Greek god and which battle does he mention in this poem, George Gordon? Yes, Vicky, the Isles of Greece. Here is the handsome Byron in Albanian costume as we listen to this beautiful poem. The Isles of Greece by Lord Byron. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung. Eternal summer kills them yet, but all except their sun is set. The mountain looks on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea. And musing there an hour alone, I dreamed that Greece might still be free. Thank you. And I think Odysseus goes to the top of the class. Which passionate poet did Byron mention? And Odysseus has got the right answer. Sappho from Lesbos, Mytilini. And which god? Phoebus, of course. And who is Phoebus? We saw him under another name earlier on. The sun god Amanda, of course, is Apollo. And the battle he mentions, 
Um, did anybody catch the battle? Well, I think we'll see it here. Here we are. You can find the battle and write it down now. The Isles of Greece were, the, were burning Sappho. Helena Collio is on the ball and she's given us marathon. You see, and the key words again. Look at these key words. The poetess of passion, of female passion, of love for the female, and the arts of war and peace. The sacred island of Delos, which is still beautiful. I still haven't been there, but I trust it is. And Phoebus Apollo, of course. The word guild, the verb, to make golden. We saw this right at the beginning. It's an adjective, the word gold, which are constantly associated with ancient Greece. Even Yeats, a very late romantic in his sailing to Byzantium, um, sailing to Greece, sailing to the old Byzantine Empire, as it were, in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople, talks about gold. So it's a very strong concept. And Marathon, this battle uh, with the Persians, which represents the courage of the Greeks, even in defeat, they were still defeating, ultimately, their opponent, whether it was the Persians or later the Ottoman Empire, with help, of course, in the second example from outsiders, as we shall see. And the word freedom, free, I dream that Greece might still be free. Here, he refers to Greece as what? There is a reference to Greece here, which is quite surprising. You would have thought he's talking about England when he says, and where art thou, my country? Which is his country? On thy voiceless shore, the heroic lay is tuneless now. My country? Which country is he talking about? When you look at the words heroic, let's have a look. The words liar, the words Spartan, Thermopylae, yes, Eleanor. He's talking about Greece again. This is his country. That's how closely this wonderful poet, this wonderful hero, um, in many senses, um, nobody's perfect, of course, but he saw Greece as his country. He'd been kicked out of England, of course, by the scandal that he was associated with, all kinds of scandals, and he had to leave like a bit like Oscar Wilde eventually. But anyway, there you are, that's Greece, his country. Now let's look at the politics of romanticism. We don't have much time, but there's a key word missing here. He says in this poem, in another part of the poem, that the Greeks should not trust their freedom to the Franks. <coughs> now who are the Franks? <coughs> well, I think they were European forces of France, Germany. And he tells us why. The Greeks should not trust the Franks, because why? What's the missing word? They have a king who shall let you down, is going to sell you out. You know, this is a, a word that goes with sell. It's a compliment to the word sell. Which other word? Yes, Mary. Yes, Eleanor. They have a king who buys and sells. Okay, they're going to, you know, it's going to be a sellout. Don't trust them. And what does Byron say to the Greeks? Trust in your own forces above all, and you will win in native swords and native ranks, soldiers. The only hope of courage dwells. Of course, the Greeks couldn't have managed it on their own, but clearly the foreigners couldn't have done it on their own either. They needed the Greeks to be committed to their own freedom. Squabble as they did, they did squabble, like hell, factions, civil war. But they were warned by Byron, you see, and you see his political philosophy. Don't trust the great powers. And we should have learned that lesson in the end, the great powers played a big part in, in modern Greece. As, as we're talking about the politics of romanticism, we should come to the most political of them all. This poet, which poet is this who wrote, Alas, the world's great age begins anew. The golden years, there's that word again. The golden years return. A brighter Hellas rears its mountains. Who is this? There's a couple of words missing for you to fill in. 
Odysseus goes to the top of the class again. Well done, Odysseus. He's come well read. He's done all his homework. And it's Shelley. Shelley writing this wonderful poem. And we're only going to look at an extract. I've given you a task to complete. Um, the words missing. The words are Athens, Orpheus, and Ulysses in gaps two, three, and four. So number two, which word is missing? Who is the singer in ancient Greek mythology? Who is the great musician? Apart from the god Apollo, of course. Number two, I've given you the choice at the top there. Have a look. Vicky Saran, Orpheus, Orpheus indeed, and dies. And who is it who leaves Calypso? My younger brother, I think, has the answer. Who abandoned the poor Calypso to her fate? Heartless man or legend, Ulysses. And of course, Athens shall arise. So let's hear this wonderful extract. From Shelley, let's hear Shelley's voice. Well, me, basically. Hellas by Percy Shelley. The world's great age begins anew. The golden years return. A brighter Hellas rears its mountains from waves serene afar. Another Orpheus sings again and loves and weeps and dies. A new Ulysses leaves once more Calypso for his native shore. Another Athens shall arise, and to remoter time bequeath, like sunset to the skies, the splendor of its prime. O oh, cease, must hate and death return. Cease, must men kill and die. Cease. Drain not to its dregs the urn of bitter prophecy. The world is weary of the past. Oh, might it die or rest at last. Well, we might feel with Shelley that we're going through a phase which we would wish to die and become the past. We've had enough, I think, of this slavery of the pandemic. But this is Shelley talking about ancient Greece and the Greek Revolution, the golden years, uh, hopefully starting again. A brighter Hellas, you see, will rise from the ashes of the past. Beautiful poem and all the key words, the splendor of its prime, ah, the sun, the sun, the Greek sun. The key words, as I've said, there they are. They capture the essence, his connection with Greek, of Greek mythology, with modern uh, Greece and Athens and this new world. And his politics, you can see, we saw Byron's politics, you know, we depend on your own strength. United, you'll win. Don't trust the foreign powers. And his, this is the politics of, of Shelley. How would you describe his politics when he says, must men kill and die? The world is weary of the past. What kind of past? Where hate and death prevail. Why are men being killed? Why do they die? Well, a lot of answers, obviously. So his politics were certainly pacifist, Amanda. Thank you. Very anti-war. He was a real radical, way ahead of his time. And the text he wrote both in his poems and his prose show us um, what a profound understanding he had of society, its economics and its politics and its inequalities. So there's the wonderful Hellas. We're nearly finishing now. Why is all this important? It's not important merely for idealistic reasons or feelings of emotion, because it gives us aesthetic pleasure. There was an aim, there was an objective in the writings of the romantics and the paintings and it was to persuade their governments to step in to help the Greeks. And three of those governments in the end, for their own reasons, I suppose, of self-interest, but because of the pressure put upon them, 
by their own interests and by the romantic poets and all the rest of the organizations, um, England, France, there, the, the, the flags are there. The Russian flag, you see, has lost its white. The white is at the top there. So these are the three governments in the end which stepped in at the Battle of Navarino, France, England, and Russia in 1827 in this decisive battle against the Turkish or Ottoman forces and the Egyptian forces. And they beat them. And this was decisive. The Greeks probably couldn't have done it on their own without this battle. So to end, we see the painters, which word comes to mind here. This is one of the most iconic paintings, which had a propaganda value. When these things were talked about or seen, um, painting like this was saying to the public, these massacres, Elena, the suffering that these people, just like we had recently in Europe and in Africa, you have these appeals by artists, by activists to you know, raise awareness of the problem and to force governments to step in. And these paintings, therefore, Chios, of course, is a word, thank you, Odysseus, which this painting uh, captures. It's uh, the massacre of Chios and Delacroix's very influential painting you see, um, of the, the crisis in, in Europe at the time, the suffering and why the great powers had to step in to stop the suffering. We began with this painting and we're finishing almost, if you're patient with me, um, which painting are we going to look at next? Again, by Delacroix. Uh, I've given you a detail here. And this is the reason perhaps that I came to Greece looking for this woman. There she is, the woman that represents freedom. All the ideals of the Greek world, ancient and modern, captured in this masterpiece by Delacroix, the ruins of Messalonghi. And of course, Messalonghi has a particular uh, significance for us today because of Byron's death there as well. And there is the poet, the painter, poet and painter, if you like, um, of these two paintings, Delacroix and the painter of the French Revolution and the later revolutions, Eugene Delacroix. And I think it's a good opportunity to say a big thank you to, to him in French, merci bien, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Delacroix, for all you did in helping to shape public opinion in favor of the Greek cause and in favor of culture and freedom. So these great romantic painters did their part and the women too. Let's not forget the women of the revolution and the women painters who stepped in and contributed their art. This is Suzanne Elizabeth Haynard, who I didn't know of before. And again, she's focusing on another catastrophe and making it public um, to raise awareness, the uh, Greek people dying as they try to to achieve their freedom. And we finish, of course, with George Gordon, Lord Byron. We say a big thank you to him, not only for his ideas and his poetry, but on a very practical level, he was involved in politics in many ways, and he raised money, and he spent his own money on behalf of Greece to buy ships, to buy weapons, and of course, he was sent to Greece eventually to represent this committee the London Greek Committee. So thank you very much, George, good old George Gordon, Lord Byron. And we finished more or less with him and his death and his flat life promised you his beautiful last poem, very moving, January the 22nd. And of course, the war will come to an end. He didn't have the pleasure to see the victory at Navarino, but these are the values that drove his motivation, his love of Greece and that of the other romantics we've talked about. To sum up, nostalgia for classical Greece, their political radicalism, importance of the emotions and nature and the love of freedom and the freedom of the individual and of nations, including Italy, we said, and then Greece. And this is the last poem, so moving, January the 22nd, this long. And it's his 36th birthday, and he writes this poem, this amazing poem. And as you listen, as we finish, tell me what he says about his age, 
<laughs> he was only 36. But what does he say? What does he have to give up in order to fight for Greece? And what does Greece mean to him in a word? Those are your three pre-questions as we listen to this poem. There are the words which you're going to listen to. Gives you some clues. It is time this heart should be unmoved. Since others it has ceased to move. Though I cannot be below, still let me love. And there's the expression from Macbeth. What does he say? My days are in the yellow. That's from Macbeth. Macbeth says this before his death. I may have lied, fallen into the seer, a yellow leaf, says Macbeth. And Byron quotes Shakespeare in his last poem. One great poet meets another. The flowers and fruits of love are gone. The canker and the grief are mine alone. So enough of that. There they are, you see. This heart is his emotions. He was a great lover, as you know. But he's saying in this poem, this heart of mine, my passions no longer move anybody. His lovers have gone. He's now devoted to the war. Since others, it has ceased to move, but he still wants to love. But where has his love been transferred to? To Greece, of course, and freedom. My days are in the yellow leaf. Flowers. And these are his final stirring words in this poem. And a few months later, he was dead. What a spirit the man had. The sword, the banner, and the field. Glory in Greece around the sea. A Spartan born upon his shield was not more free. Awake, not Greece. She is awake. Awake my spirit, he says. Think through whom my life blood tracks its parent. Well, who is his parent? Why does he use this word? This is your last question. And then I won't ask you anymore. Who is the parent he refers to? The parent late from which his lifeblood tracks its source. Greece, says Amanda, indeed it is Greece. So before he referred to it as his country, now it is his parent. It is the be all and the end all. And his final words, the land of honorable death is here. And he dies a soldier, had it not been for malaria, up to the field and give away thy breath. Let him speak for himself before he takes his rest. Thank you. Listen to this. If you have tears, January the 22nd, to shed them now. Thessaloniki. On this day, I complete my 36th year by Lord Byron. Tis time this heart should be unmoved, since others it hath ceased to move. Yet though I cannot be beloved, Still let me be loved. My days are in the yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of love are gone. The worm, the canker, and the grief are mine alone. The fire that on my bosom preys is lone as some volcanic isle. No torch is kindled at its blaze, a funeral pile. The hope the fear, the jealous care, the exalted portion of the pain and power of love, I cannot share, but wear the chain. But tis not thus, and tis not here, such thoughts should shake my soul, nor now, where glory decks the hero's beer, or binds his brow. The sword, the banner, and the field, Glory and Greece around a sea. The Spartan born upon his shield was not more free. Awake, not Greece, she is awake. Awake, my spirit. Think through whom thy lifeblood tracks its parent lake. And then strike home, tread those reviving passions down. Unworthy manhood, unto thee indifference should 
the smile or frown of beauty be. If thou regrets thy youth, why live? The land of honourable death is here. Up to the field and give away thy breath. Seek out, less often sought than found, a soldier's grave. For thee, the best. Then look around and choose thy ground and take thy rest. There's a word there in the background in Greek. Can the Greek speakers translate it for us in the chat box for our non-Greek speakers? And it sums up everything we've been talking about, everything that Byron stands for, everything we lovers of literature believe in the end is so important. And the Greek word there in the painter, painters included this word, eleftheria, beautiful word, as it is beautiful in English and I'm sure in Turkish and in Italian and in French, this sweet word freedom, which today, as you can see, is still uh, a struggle we have to fight to maintain our freedom with all the things going on. So that's a lovely word on which to finish, and a lovely, powerful image of the indeed handsome Byron, beautiful inside and out. He really was a charismatic man. And all I've read about him confirms that he was more good than bad. And that's not an easy thing to achieve. So we thank him for today. Without him, we couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it on my own. Couldn't have done it without you. Thank you for joining in. Uh, my band of brothers and sisters. We few, we happy few. So thank you very much. Uh, you can switch. I think I can switch you back on now. How do I unmute mute you? How can I unmute you? So can you do it yourselves? Can you unmute yourselves? We can do it ourselves. Oh, you can. Thank you, Penelope. So there you are. Thank you very much for being with me. You're welcome to, to say hello. Uh, ask me any questions. Um, I don't, you don't just have to use the chat box. We can speak to each other now. We've had enough of being isolated from each other. Um, apart from your thanks. Do you have any other comments or questions? It wasn't uh, uh, something to, I don't know, to test you or make life difficult, but to celebrate. It was a celebration. So don't worry if you don't have any questions, as long as you enjoyed it and um, enjoyed the trip, even if the destination was disappointing. All right. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks so much. Thank you, you very much, Luke. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Luke, thank you. It was even thank more you. powerful being, being locked up at home. Yes, well, I suppose it is appropriate, isn't it? It's nice yeah. to find ways of coming together. Yeah. From Argentina, I see, Felicita, Rosalia, uh, from Argentina, Argentina, you in London, others in Rome, others in Greece, Turkey. It's great to come together and remind us Naples. of and Naples, that we are not alone, that we must remember, though, what brings us together. Inspire. I love the love of freedom. Yeah, and how it inspires, inspires us to remember so we have courage in these difficult times. Yeah. And this wonderful set of poets that we looked at, there's so many of them in all languages, because that's the ultimate message literature has a part to play in our lives and in education in our thinking and if only politicians could see this way we wouldn't have april fool's day which i dedicate to our <laughs> politicians today they're celebrating their name day the april fools so good luck to them and good luck to you and thank you for being with me patricia from naples thank you so much and from, thank you. Thank you. from messina in sicily okay thank you well if you have thank nothing you. more to say I have a question. I can let you go. I have a question. Yes, Odysseus, don't embarrass me now. What's the question? <laughs> well, uh, here I sit in Cyprus, April the 1st, where they celebrate their uh, struggle for independence from Britain. And I wonder, what, what did it actually achieve? We still have uh, British bases here. We have 40% of the Indeed. island occupied. Yes, Odysseus. 1821 revolution. 
it was yeah. fought uh, for a republic, and that's what um, what Byron and Shelley uh, yes, were. Yes, yeah, they weren't royalists, yeah. certainly. Yeah, we ended up with a uh, Greece ended up with a seventeen year old Bavarian king. Yeah. The Greek yeah. Revolution was fought for the slogan or the battle cry of fatherland and faith. We ended up with a king that was a Catholic, married <laughs> to a Protestant, uh, philandering with his dad's girlfriend. And uh, as for fatherland, uh, it was uh, very much run by Bavarian, French, British. Yeah, and still is, Odysseus. And You're absolutely Northern right. I mean, that's why this is important. It was important then, it's important now to see that the great powers, which today's globalization and the great powers of our finance and, and capital who are calling the shots, pharmaceutical companies, you name it. I mean, the struggles are still, as you know, very well. We have to fight, and I said this earlier on, uh, again and again from the beginning, every generation has to fight for their freedom. It's not given on a plate from generations. We don't inherit the freedom. We have to maintain it. And they will eat away at the freedom in various ways, on a global level or a local level. So you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. yes. this is why I think these yes, yes, yes. may have a place to remind us that it's a long-term struggle. And what are the values that we're talking about? What do we believe? We believe in the brotherhood and, and the comradeship of country with other countries and respect for each other's freedom. But of course, the finances, you know, the capital behind all of this is a driving force. The interests of those, you know, you know, capital, capitalist forces do determine our fates still. So we can just fight and keep, keep struggling, as you know. Take up the cudgel, hopefully inspired by our knowledge of history, our warmth, which we share for certain values and, you know, hope that things can only get better if we work together. Notice what Byron said, trust not the Franks. The Franks yeah. used to mean the Europeans by extension, you know, it's France and Germany and so on. But the i Franchi, you could say, in the affair de monogata franga, you know, <laughs> that's a pun which I got from Vicky. Um, like my, my partner, the Franchi, the Franks are interested only in money. And you see Byron said, the Frankish king, the king of France, is only interested in buying and selling. He's gonna sell you off, be careful, don't trust them. That's, that, that was my subject today. Obviously it agrees with what you're saying and the perspective of, you know, the problem is still with us in its many different forms. I just wanted to make the connection with uh, this movement in the past, the connection with the presence, indeed. So you're right to make those connections. Otherwise, we're just enjoying the aesthetics of it. And, you know, that's fine, but it's a personal pleasure. And we have to go beyond that if we're going to resist the forces which threaten our freedom, that key word at the end, eleftheria. So thank you, Odi. And thank you for everybody joining in. I'm not leaving my own here. Um, Anna, are you all right? How are you feeling? Oh, it's more, I think it's more than Anna. Anna, Sandra, you're what I can see here on my screen. Oh, I so you got here third time. I did, and it was worth it. Thank yeah. you very much, Anna. Well, I, 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 please, it reminds you that exactly we can't sit on our laurels, laurels, yeah. ancient Greece that we have to continue fighting for our freedom. Yeah. That's the main message, I think, and the, the yeah. great Tony Benn said this, the great, you know, leader of progressive movements, he said, every generation must fight for democracy again and again from the beginning. You know, it's not given to you. No. And it's so true. And if we remember that, not take it for granted, we take things for granted. We trust these people. We trust these forces, we shouldn't. And education, which we are, most of us are educators, should be about critical thinking, about connecting the past with the present, not in this idealistic way, all these people were heroes, let's worship them, because they weren't. 
the Greek heroes, they squabble amongst themselves. And Byron, as you know, was very disappointed when he found them squabbling amongst themselves. And who's going to share the spoils of victory? And this has gone on ever since. And it happens in a lot of countries, not just Greece. But this is the way life is. We have to understand it. We look at what is positive. We yeah. ignore the struggle. And he said, you know, native hands, trust your native hands, your native forces, the native ranks. He knew what he was talking about. As we say in Greek, above all. And this applies to teachers today struggling for their rights and other working people. First of all, they have to stick together. This is what the romantics are teaching us. You are not alone. You're part of a big movement. Stand together. Believe in each other. Believe in something common and good. The evil is always there. That's the way life is. We can't get rid of it. And every generation will produce its Hitlers. It will produce its Donald Trumps. And again and again. And so it goes on. So anyway, that's why we've come together to celebrate literature and wow. these politically minded poets, amongst other things they had. They were aware of the society in which they lived which is why I contextualized it in terms of the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution. They weren't just clever with words, as we are taught at school. What a pretty poem Daffodils is. It's a much abused poem. It's more than just pretty. He's saying nature is the great teacher. Listen to nature. Respect nature. We didn't respect nature, Anna. And here we are with COVID, whether it's because we're eating bats when we shouldn't, or whether we're experimenting in laboratories, we didn't respect the natural processes. We thought we're cleverer. This is Faustus and Mephistopheles. We went beyond our you know, rights to interfere with nature. So that abuse, I think we're paying for it now, one way or the other, with COVID. So I see connections. I see these teachers, Blake, is a teacher still. Byron is a teacher, not just the, the, the creator of love poems. We'll go no more a roving so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. At the same time, you notice that at the end, he says, this heart of mine no longer moves others to love. He's dropped the love thing because he's fighting for freedom. And without freedom, forget the love as well. You know, you're gonna be in prison somewhere if you're not careful. And he was lucky, unlike Oscar Wilde, who paid for his libertinism, if you like. He went beyond liberty to yeah. be a bit naughty. So there you go. So there's Byron, fascinating character, wonderful literature about him. There's a very good book by Michael Foote, called the Poly uh, Byron and the Politics of Paradise, which is a wonderful uh, account of his beliefs and his poetry, his politics. Um, thank you, Banu, from uh, Istanbul or Turkey. She took her back to university days when she studied the Romantics, but not at this depth, she says. <laughs> I really think that was deep. Thank you very much. It wasn't meant to be deep, but uh, Hector Mavridis, my dear friend, is absolutely at your best. Well, thank you, Hector, for being here a second time. Sucker for punishment. Yes, I did try to make it more interactive this time, which is why I wanted to repeat the talk. I didn't find the first effort was interactive enough. I hope you found you were involved in as I was building this talk, and I'm happy with your contributions. It's not easy to have the teacher looking at your writing and your answers. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, it wasn't a test. It was a game of sharing. And it's much more fun for me if I see what you're thinking. So there's a lesson there in, for me in how to go about presenting these things. Involve the audience from the beginning. So that's, I made some changes, you see. So the recording, which is still going on, I must stop it. We've got all this stuff here. It'll be on YouTube for those people who've asked me, how can we catch up with you? If we miss the talk, I hope I can download it and uh, put it on my YouTube channel and I'll give people details of that. So thank you once again. You cheered me up in these gloomy times. 
Uh, it's a cold day here still. Tomorrow the sunshine will be back, we're told. And I hope the sun will be back for you too, wherever you are. So keep in touch and thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Et Christo. And uh, what's the Turkish word for? Thank you. Thank you. I can never pronounce it. I've said it so many times in Turkey. Thank you very much. I'll get round to it. Grazie mille, Patrizia. Grazie mille. <laughs> okay, Odi, thank you very much for everything, Odysseus. You've traveled all that all the way from Ithaca to be with us today. Okay, I hope you didn't find the journey was a disappointment when you got to the end of it. Was Ithaca? I think I know what these Ithacas mean now. <laughs> I'll see you later. Enough of this nonsense. I'm switching you all off now. Thank you. Thank you. So if you want to stop Happy sharing, okay. everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.